Hello, hello. Welcome to the John Katz Show. We are here for uh, episode number three. Just going to be me solo today, doing a little solo rant episode, I guess we can call it. Uh, We will be back soon with some more interviews, though. Uh, I don't know if you all caught Monday's episode or not. If not, check it out. Had my man Raw on. He's going to be back every Monday doing a similar segment. We're going to have some fun with that. Calling it Raw Mondays. But uh, we are definitely also going to clean up some of that uh, Skype audio video stuff we had going on in that episode. So bear with us. We are a brand new show. We're working out some of the kinks. But um, we will uh, we'll be bringing him back and bringing back a lot of other interesting guests as well. So please stay tuned for that. And also, I just wanted to tell you guys, uh, you know, please send us in any questions. We want to spark some discussions, and I want to read some people's questions on here. So uh, Twitter at John Katz Show or John at JohnKatzShow.com. Uh, send any questions, any topics you think would be interesting to discuss, and I will definitely be reading them all, especially since we're just starting out. So I appreciate it very much. Hit us up anytime. Thank you. Thank you. And... Uh, speaking of that, just, uh, wanted to get some stuff off my chest, I guess today, like I said, do a little solo rant here, but I don't know, maybe I'm spending too much time on, uh, social media, too much time reading Twitter. I'm not sure. Maybe it's getting to me a little bit, but, um, one of the things that I'm really seeing cropping up out there, you know, we're seeing a lot of in my opinion, dangerous and detrimental mentalities. Uh, They seem to be growing. I had mentioned in the intro there's a lot of polarization going on, but this is something different. Um, I guess the short question I would ask is, you know, what's going on? And this is not a political thing. Look, like I said, this is not a political show. These are societal issues. Um... These are cultural issues. In fact, it bothers me when people make certain things into political. Everything's a political issue now, right? So I have a flag behind me, right? It's an American flag. Suddenly, the American flag's political. You have to be on a certain party to like the American flag or to support our country. And I guess that's kind of my topic, which is, you know, uh, what the hell's going on with all the America hate lately? And I don't mean people outside America. I mean, Americans, um, that's not a political thing. When did it become, you know, popular to hate the country or unpopular to be patriotic? Um, I don't know when that happened. You know, it used to be, didn't matter if you were a Democrat or Republican, you love the country, you love the flag. You may have disagreed on policies and societal issues and things like that and how to get to where we ultimately wanted to go even though we want to go to the same places like I say people disagree on how to get there but there's never a hatred for our country you know there was an appreciation there was an understanding people uh, had some humility you know they they appreciated who came before and what they'd sacrificed and all the great things they had you know Imagine like, imagine you had a child. Imagine there's a child, right? And he's one of, imagine, you, bear with me on this analogy. All right, imagine you have a hundred children, all right? You got one child out of a hundred who's top of the list, right? Works harder than everybody, smarter than everybody, more resourceful than everybody. He's the best kid, or he's, let's say, you know, top five, Right? Well, would you insult him all the time and try to tear him down and pick apart the one or two things or a few things that may be wrong with him? Or worse yet, would you bring up all the shit he did when he was five, when he was a kid or a littler kid, and harp on all those mistakes and tell him what a horrible child he is for all the shit that he did in the past? Of course not. What good would that do? How would that help the kid? How would that help anybody? In fact... Other kids act that way, you know. Um, Kids try to tear people down or immature. Adults don't act that way, shouldn't act that way. Why do we do it with our country? 
why do we focus all our energy? I shouldn't say we. Why do so many people lately focus all their energy on the imperfections and on the mistakes and on the past? You know, why not look at it objectively? Um, yes, we're not perfect. No one's perfect. No country's perfect. No person is perfect. We've done a million things wrong. Everyone's done a million things wrong. We have ugly stains on our past. Every country, every territory has ugly stains. But you, you want to tear it down or you want to try to improve? You know, um, you know, before we didn't become the, the greatest nation in the world by accident. You know, we didn't just luck our way into this thing like some people seem to think. Uh, it was a very intentional, focused plan and that we, you know, laid the groundwork for and we set the example for nations all over the world to this day. And people want to tear it down because they don't understand it or because they're looking for a scapegoat. I don't know. I'm asking why. It just seems like there's a lot of anti-American. And, you know, before people start tearing up, wanting to tear up the Constitution, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, tear down statues, tear down George Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson and our founding fathers, what if they sat and just learned a little bit about our actual history, who these men really were, what they stood for in their personal lives, how they evolved, how they changed, how they went on to help so many people and to set the example for centuries. <sighs> With more context, if people understood it better, they'd understand what we've been fighting for since the inception. They don't understand what we fought so hard to achieve and the millions of people that died to achieve it and I feel like if they just understand it, the hate would be diminished. Am I wrong? You know, they need to learn what real tyranny is, what real fascism is. We're the least fascistic country in the world. We're the least tyrannical country in the world. I don't care who our president is. We're the least of all of those things. You can't even call this stuff out other places, by the way. But what's the goal here? Look at, look at, Antifa, right? I guess like they're the epitome of this anti-American movement, right? But their name, Antifa, anti-fascist or anti-fascism or whatever. I'm sure you've seen these people running through the streets and breaking windows and all kinds of stuff with the black helmets and the skinny jeans and stuff like that. So they're against fascism, right? But they're against what? Fascism in the United States? We're fascist? What fascism are they fighting? In fact, not only is there no fascism in this country to fight, and like I said, you can't even bring up real fascism, not that they know what it is. Most of the fascism in the world right now, and again, this isn't a political thing, right? But it's mostly left-wing, communistic nature, Marxist nature, Leninist nature. This isn't, you know, people always think, obviously, and as a Jewish person, obviously, it's a big, big deal, the Holocaust, right? That was a right-wing, nationalistic, uh, fascistic movement, but comes from the left just as often, if not more, and certainly today, far more common, you know, China, Cuba, Venezuela. All that aside, this is about our country right now, not the rest of the world. That's another episode, maybe. Excuse me. In any case, you can name yourselves whatever you want, right? But if, if the way you act yourself is fascistic, you can't be against fascism. I mean, the name doesn't mean anything. And then you hide behind the name <clears throat> when people call out your behavior. So um, if they understood, if they had the historical context, if they saw the death, the destruction, the starvation, the genocide that comes along with what real fascism is and what comes along when you remove and diminish freedoms and liberties because that's what they're doing they're trying to trying to diminish the system and the freedoms and everything that flag stands for they're trying to diminish it all and tear it down and replace it with what 
they think it's a new idea. This version of uh, anti-freedom, anti-liberty, anti-capital, this is not new. This has been going on since the beginning of time. It always ends in death and destruction and starvation, and it always will end that way, and it will never work. And all people really want at the end of the day is an opportunity. Just give people an opportunity. Help people when you can. Um, but if people have no context of history, they're never going to understand what we're fighting to protect, what we've always fought to protect, what we'll continue fighting to protect. And there's nothing more important than that. Uh, they'll never recognize the enemy. And, and like I said, in most cases, they themselves will become the enemy that they thought they were fighting so hard to protect us against. Um, they, ju- they don't even realize that the movement is the exact same thing that occurs every time you've end up, ended up with a fascist dictatorship every single time throughout history. Almost every single time started with very similar intentions and a very similar ideology. And it doesn't take more than cracking open a couple of history books to figure that one out. You know, and to be honest, we've never had, ironically, a stronger, a more fair, a more equal society, less racist, less sexist, less homophobic. We're better at all those things. I don't know any actual racists in my life. I grew up in the South in Virginia. I didn't even know racists there. Very rare. You know, true sexist. Look, do people say racist shit? Sure. Do people say sexist shit? Sure. Do they actually do racist and sexist? It's very small. Very small amount of people. And, you know, we can't, we can't take periods that existed in the past that were imperfect and ugly times in our history and then act like those issues still exist today. We have to address the issues that actually exist. And then even worse, what we do even more, you can't take modern societal standards and norms and what's considered acceptable and then apply them to people of the past that lived in a different time. You know, why not just label every man that lived up until 100, 200 years ago a pedophile? I mean, they all married 14-year-olds, right? You know, people were living to be, what, 30 or 40? That was the norm back then, right? Society was different. Women were far more mature by that age. They were work, Whatever they were doing. That's a whole other discussion. But everyone was marrying teenagers. Can't have sex with a teenager today. That's fine. It's acceptable. But we can't now apply that rule and say everybody was a pedophile. If you were a good and decent person born into the South during like a long time period, you're automatically evil. What are you evil when you leave the fetus? No good people lived during that period in those states. That's preposterous. You know, you can't take what we currently consider acceptable and then say, you can't even go back 30 years, 40 years and start doing stuff like that. You know, Somebody dressed up at a party in the 70s or in high school or grabbed a titty at a party when they were 15 or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, what are we doing? Look at where we are today and then let's move forward and reckon. You can't, the main theme, look, you can't let emotion cloud logic. Again, that's what kids do, right? You get emotional and then you don't think logically and make intelligent decisions or intelligent assessments. You know, tearing down history, getting worked up into a frenzy and and saying, well, let's, let's tear it all down because it was all bad and it was all evil. Whose life is that? It's not helping a single person's life. In fact, you're hurting people because you're making future generations more ignorant You're depriving them of context. What? To protect them from hearing truths about how ugly and tough and raw life used to be. Now, fucking electricity back then indoors. I mean, think about it. This is a much different life we're talking about. 
So you just want to protect people from hearing what it was like. And then what? Then they don't even know what it was we're fighting to protect all this time. They'll have no context. They'll just think, well, we lucked our way into this thing. Excuse me. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how we got here. We're just lucky. Let's just tear it all down. I'm sure we could run it just as well and make something else that works just as well. Because that's worked every time in the world when people have tried. So, look, um, emotion, right? People get emotional and they don't make logical decisions. I'll bring up an example. Look at, um, look at George Floyd, the George Floyd case. I'm not talking about the murder or anything like that. Look, any anyone gets killed by a cop unnecessarily or any killed by any, they got to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Stick them in jail ASAP, all of that. I'm not even talking about that. I'm not talking about the crime. I'm talking about the effect that that had on that that murder had on society, right? Because it's a very emotional thing and it's a very emotional thing to see. And you were, you're watching somebody get killed on camera. So understandably, it's very emotional. But then what happens, right? George Floyd gets killed and boom. Now it's 24-7 George Floyd got killed. Every news station, and this is a new phenomenon, right? The internet, Twitter, Instagram, you can flood people 24 hours a day, seven days a week with sensationalism, and people are dying to eat that stuff up. And it's this echo chamber of this emotional frenzy, emotional frenzy, and all of a sudden, everyone's a racist. Every cop's evil. The country's evil. We're all based on, you know, founders that were evil and shitty, and everyone's evil and shitty, and we're all racist. (sighs) There's nothing worse. There's nothing more counterproductive that we can do. I mean, what sense does that make, right? So what's the first reaction? First reaction is defund the police. Now, I, look, I know people didn't mean literally defund the police. They meant transfer resources from this pers- this department to that department, things like that, and you know, less armed forces and so forth. Why would you remove resources from something that doesn't work well? Why would you, if your car was broken, would you take parts out of the car or would you put money and labor into the car to make it work again? If, if you ran a business, if you ran a company and the company was struggling and it wasn't performing well, would you take resources out of the company as a way to fix it or would you put re- resources into it? I mean, this is simple logic, but people don't apply simple logic when they're upset, right? You can't allow emotions to take over decision making. Correct decision would be more funding, not less. How do you improve a police department and get rid of the bad apples? Give them more resources. If you pay police less, do you think the quality of police or anybody, you name the job, pay them less. Is the quality going to go down or up? You're going to get a better cop or a worse cop for less money and less resources and benefits and so forth. And what if you paid a cop twice as much? What if you started them at a hundred six? Everyone was six figures. What if a six figure minimum, hundred grand across the board? You know, more for bigger cities and so forth. Would you get better cops or worse cops? Better candidates or worse for people that are qualified to make that kind of money? I mean, look, I'll I'll lay out a whole logical. Here's how I would fix the police, right, with more resources. You go, where do the resources go to? Because so far I've heard no solution. If there's actually bad apples, by the way, we've all met shitty cops. They do exist, right? There's shitty cops. There's racist cops. There's all kinds. Not to be cliche, yes, most are good good dudes. I've known a lot of cops. They're good dudes. A lot of them are also have a whole other complex going on. They became a cop for the complete wrong reasons. And those guys just treat everybody like a fuck. But again... This goes towards that too. This only get, not only gets rid of racists and, and reduces killers, 
you get less douchebags too, right? So number one, high stress training. You put these guys through the same exact regimen that you put high special forces, Navy SEALs, not the physical stuff, right? They don't have to be physically, you, to be a cop, you don't have to be a Navy SEAL physically, fine. But the mental stuff they put those guys through, I'm sure you've all seen these documentaries. We all have. Those guys, those are the toughest dudes ever. They fold. The ones that start crying and shaking. Look, I'm not knocking it. I couldn't do it. I'd be crying and shaking too. They put me in the fucking Navy SEAL test. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you put people in a high stress situation, you're going to see the ones that fold really fast. And I can tell you these cops that are killing people, 99% of the time probably, it's because they can't handle themselves in a high stress situation. Right? Right? Just the, the statistics alone on what it does to somebody, um, you know, high-speed chase, physical encounter, when your adrenaline's just flowing off the charts. What if you've never been in that situation before? You're going to freak the fuck out. You're going to panic. And you can weed a lot of these guys out. You put people in real high-stress situations where they're really feeling these things, and you see how they react. And the ones that don't react well... They're going to have to get the fuck out. And by the way, the ones who react okay, just going through that training is going to benefit them. Because then when they're out in the field and they experience those things and they experience, it's not the first time they felt it. They felt it a dozen times the month they had to spend at, at, the, at the camp, at the training facility. So it's not going to be new to them. It's not going to be foreign to them. That's number one, right? So... You weed out all the psychos. You weed out all the... Maybe not the psychos, right? That's coming next. But you you at least weed out the guys who can't, you know, mentally hack that type of thing. And look, again, I'm not cut out for it. So I don't want to say they're mentally weak or anything like that. It's a very small group of people that should be doing this job. Number two, actual psychological. I'm talking full barrage, psychological evaluations, Weeks worth, the type of shit, like if you wanted to get into the CIA or the NSA or anything like that, assessed by the top psychological professionals that we have access to in the country. And look, again, this would take resources. This would take funding. But this is a really important job. We're putting these guys out there with with guns. We're asking them to decide whether to use these guns or not. Probably something that uh, would be important to have these you know, full smorgasbord of psychological eval. I think that would be helpful. Look at, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The next thing I would do is physical grappling, ground training, certification, something where these guys are comfortable with ground fighting, ground control, body positioning, the ability to control a perp. I can't tell you how many videos. Look at the uh, Rayshard Brooks video. The the one, uh, the man that was uh, sleeping in the, I think it was a Wendy's drive-thru. He was passed out drunk or sleeping in the Wendy's drive-thru. These two cops had him on the ground trying to cuff him for DUI or whatever. And one cop even had his back. Um, they had no, not the first clue of how to subdue this guy. I mean, the one on the back, his legs were out, sprawled. You know, day three of jiu-jitsu class, he would have figured out how to sink his hooks in and secure that guy's back. And again, just like I was talking about with like the, the special forces type stress training and all that stuff, it's, it's, you're accomplishing two things. One, you're actually learning a skill, right? So all these videos you've seen where cops are tussling with a guy for a while. And by the way, cops get killed that way a lot too, right? All that could be avoided with the ground, the ground control, the ground grappling. So many cases, it starts with the tussle. The guy gets away, goes for the gun, overpowers the cop. Now he's on top of the guy. If you're a cop, you can't fight on the ground. You're leaving yourself no choice but to shoot people sometimes, even justified shootings, right? Let's say you try to handcuff a guy 
and he rolls you over, and now he's on top of you, and he's beaten. Now, well, now you shoot him, and that's it's a justified shooting. The guy was on top of me. He was going for my weapon. He was punching me in the face. You should have never been in that position. You and your partner should have been trained for that. Not that it's going to work every time. You're going to run into somebody, excuse me, somebody tougher or somebody also, you know, look, it's not like you're just going to go out there like Superman and beat everybody up. It certainly can't hurt. And then, again, the other thing, and probably just as important, the training itself. You're going to be rolling around on a mat with guys who are stronger, bigger, controlling you. So you'll have felt that. And you'll you'll have needed to feel it and not even panicked in those situations. That's the most important part. So some of these cops, again, they might not have even been in a fight before. Now you got some big guy on top of you holding you down. You've never felt that versus a guy that's felt it 100 times in training. And he knows, okay, if a guy's on top of me, especially if you're if it's an untrained person and you're trained, how easily you can shift body control and control their posture and control their hips and control their... I mean, if they don't know what they're doing, why would you go out there not knowing what you're doing? Why would we send cops out there not knowing any of this stuff? I've actually not understood that for a long time. So there you go. Those three things. Being a cop is, should be considered one of the hardest jobs in the world, hardest jobs in the country. And it should be treated that way. Again, we're there are actual real violent criminals around, right? A lot of violent crime. There's a lot of shootings, a lot of rape, everything, every day. Read, you know, I was going to say read the crime statistics. Don't read the crime statistics. The point is, it's a really tough job. 90% of society is not going to be cut out for this. They're not cut out for... You're, you're saying to someone, here, take this gun, take these deadly weapons, go out in the street, approach dangerous criminals all day, and other people, but approach a lot of criminals, like, you know, armed robbery in progress, you got to show up, and now you got to make a split decision on when to use that weapon, when to use deadly, I don't want that responsibility, I don't want that job, but If you did all those things, the people that had that job would be a million times better, no? Which is better, right? So let's say you did a trillion dollar bill. to I don't know, I'm making up numbers. I don't know what the fuck it would cost. Excuse me. Let's say you did a trillion dollar bill to fund all those things, right? Everything I just named. You bump the salary up, 100K and up. Start cops at six figures, number one. Number two, you put them through the Navy SEAL high-stress training. Number three, you give them an incredible amount of psychological evaluations. Number four, the ground grapple. And the grappling, by the way, that can continue as they're a cop, and it should. They should have to be like a blue belt or something. Maybe they take a couple weeks. I don't know what the first word is, the white belt. You get the first belt, fine. You keep going after you're a cop until you get a blue. You got to get the blue. A lot of them probably love it to be more disciplined people. All I ever hear from MMA guys, from UFC guys, is that the biggest benefit they ever got from jiu-jitsu or wrestling practice or anything like that is the discipline and the respect, the calmness. So if you have that, that's half the battle, right? Staying calm, not freaking out, not ready to just shoot somebody. I got pulled over like six months ago by this. First of all, it was a woman cop by herself, which I have an issue with too, because again, not saying women can't be cops, right? But putting a woman out there by herself, like no wonder this woman was nervous, which I'll get to, but she's going to be in a position where she's going to have to use her weapon more often. What if she gets in a physical confrontation with a 250 pound man? What are the odds? I mean, no cops should probably be out there by themselves, right? Especially not, you know, a 5'4", 120-pound woman. So I didn't even break any laws. She pulled me over. I guess she said I made, like, a aggressive lane change or something. But she comes up to the passenger side window. She's Her voice is trembling. She's got her hand ready on her holster. 
And she basically just, you know, antagonized me for 30 minutes about what a shitty driver I am. But I wasn't speeding and she couldn't give me a ticket for anything. But with what I just laid out, there's no way either A, this woman wouldn't be acting like that. Because she'd be a much more well-trained, disciplined individual. Or she wouldn't even be a cop because she wouldn't have probably made it through any of that stuff. I'm not judging this woman. I guess I am judging this woman. But it's just one example of a million. Not Again, not everybody's cut out for this job. And it should be a very select few. It should be the cream of the crop. We should be, you know, the best of the best of the best doing this job. Not anybody. That can just get through a basic academy. It's got to be a million times more stringent than that. Okay. Well, apparently, <laughs> apparently I have a lot to say about how to fix the police force. So we'll move on from that. Um, something else that's been bothering me is this. Look, and this is obviously tangentially related, you know, with race and so forth. It's been in the discourse lately, right? Why does everybody have to point out everybody's race all the time and identify people by the color of their skin? Um, Isn't that in in and of itself racist to always group people by how they look or their race or their nationality or their religion or the color of their skin? You know, nobody mentions the color of people's skin more than the people who supposedly are protesting or fighting against racism. That's what racists do, right? They're doing the same thing. No one's happier that they're doing that than actual racists, right? Why point out everyone's skin all the time? Why not just be you and I'll just be me? It's like, um, it's like the people that are always... You know, the guy that's always gay bashing, right? He's always not, I don't know what gay bashing is. That's a term for like a physical assault. I just mean someone who's um, constantly putting gay people down and, you know, randomly making comments against gay people. I usually assume that guy's gay, right? He must have tendencies that he's harboring to try to hide that. If I see somebody in the name of saying they're anti racist, constantly calling people out by the color of their skin and trying to separate everybody out by the color of their skin. I'm going to assume that person's racist. Because why else would you do that? And also, stop accusing every... It's like, it's again, it's psych 101, right? Everyone's a racist now. We all became racists overnight. It doesn't make sense. Stop accusing everybody of racism. Recognize all people aren't racist and stop identifying everybody by the color of their skin. You know, again, there's very few real racists in society these days, at least in my experience. I don't know that that's even anecdotal because if I asked every single person I know and, you know, I guess that's still anecdotal, whatever. KKK has like five dudes right now and they'd all be thrilled by people dividing themselves by their skin color and segregating themselves because it's exactly what they want to do too. So, look. Are there any laws that need to be changed? Are there any policies that need to be changed that would reduce racism? I mean, you guys tell me. Are there laws right now that are racist or that preclude certain groups um, from being able to participate in things on a government level. Because to me, it just seems like the racism exists on an individual level. And how do you protest? You know, you go back to the civil rights movement, right? Or women's suffrage movement, right? When people actually had rules or laws that needed to be changed to make it equal for everybody. But you don't have that now. So they're protesting Technically, individual behavior. How do you protest individual behavior? By pretending everyone else is racist? That doesn't make any sense. In fact, 
the more you dilute the word racist or racism, the harder it's going to be to find a real racist. Right? Because everyone's racist. How are you ever going to identify the real racist? You know? But now we have more protesting on race and things like sexism. We've never been better at these things than we have till now. And now there's more protesting than ever before. Why is that? There are horrible people out there. There are some racists. There are some sexists. There's way worse people than that. You know, there's molesters and murderers and rapists and a million other things, right? But you can't find those people and neutralize them with a law or a rule. There's no law to change. If there was a law to change for racism... Everybody would change it. In this day and age, who's not going to change that law? Everyone vote for that and it'd be unanimous. Right? If there was a government law that said, if you're this race or you're this religion or whatever, you can't participate in X, Y, and Z. You know, who wouldn't change that? Those laws have been changed forever. Everybody loves... Anybody that's an actual racist or an actual sexist or not, they love when people do this shit. They love when people who are supposedly against them do exactly what they want them to do. Don't feed that devil. Just be a person. Let people be people. That alone will do worlds more than any law or rule anybody could think of. And then while we're at it, let's stop telling people they're victims all the time and that the system's rigged against them. Isn't that kind of a little racist sometimes too? I mean, nothing's more demeaning and offensive and counterproductive than telling people they're victims, right? Why not give them information and tools instead? Look at Kevin Hart. I don't know. Are you all familiar with Kevin Hart's organization? I've seen him give interviews and stuff on this. Kevin Hart started a whole org where it's exactly what he does. It's, it's all about, like he says, tools and information. He came from very humble, modest upbringings, whatever you want to call it. And look, no one's saying you're going to be selling out Madison square garden, right? But whatever you're good at, he goes to inner cities. He goes to underprivileged areas And that's his main mission is strictly to provide these people with info, right? How do you access the banking system? How do you pay your taxes? How do you invest in the stock market? The reason that it seems like people don't have access to these things is usually because they don't know. No one, they don't, you don't have the information, you know, instead people do the opposite, right? You get the ultra successful people, which is even more insane. You get, AOC, the the Congress lady out of the Bronx, or look at LeBron James, right? These these people reached the pinnacle of success in their chosen field. The pinnacle of success. And their message is that the country's unfair and that people are oppressed and people are victims. What kind of message is that? How are you helping? What if they all did, what if hundreds of them, celebs, athletes, whoever, public figures? What if they all had Kevin Hart's message? What if AOC and LeBron were visiting underprivileged neighborhoods and saying, you know what? You might have had a tougher start than other people, but I came from exactly where you did. And look at me. I did it. I was a a bartender and now I'm a congresswoman, right? Here's how I did it. And here's how you can do it too. Here's the information. Here's the roadmap. And if I can do it, you could do it too. What's a better message? Saying the system's rigged and you're never going to achieve your goals. Right? Who's that helping? So go and go, yeah, I guess it is. You're right. Now what? <laughs> Don't try. Like, what does that message do? What's a better message? That or I came from where you did. I did it. You could the Kevin Hart message. 
he should be speaking up every time. I don't know if you guys haven't heard him. What a fucking motivational guy, honestly. And not just because of that, because of everything. But that message does so much. You're like, you're literally every time, I guarantee every time someone from his organization or him or whoever, I don't know if it's him going down there, right? I guarantee you every single time someone from his organization goes and speaks somewhere, someone gets tangible help from that experience. They learned something. They were provided with a piece of information that they didn't have before. What are they getting when people tell them the opposite? Nothing. They, in fact, they get angrier, you know, and it becomes like this whole self-fulfilling prophecy. It really does. Nothing worse. Nothing more damaging to people. It's so condescending. Why would you look at someone and say, you're not good enough to do what I did? I'm, I'm so special that only I could do it. And again, you don't have to be LeBron James or a congressperson or a famous anything, or a millionaire, or even rich. Maybe just a decent little job that you're qualified for, something stable, a career, a salary, the ability to invest money and understand how that stuff works. My grandpa was a mailman his whole life, right? The guy saved up more than almost anyone I know on, as a mailman. No, I mean, look. Our grandpa, my grandfathers came here. Look, I don't want to get into the whole thing again. Identifying people, right? These are Eastern European Jews. No one's thousands of years of slavery and oppression and genocide. Who's had it worse than the Jews? These guys came here with nothing, right? No one spoke the language. Their parents didn't speak English. They didn't speak English. They came here with nothing, right? All they wanted was the opportunity. All they wanted was to know that if I work really hard, if I live a good and decent life, I can provide for my family. I can have a better life than I had before. They didn't want to be told they were victims. It would have been so cringeworthy for them to hear that, you know? They wanted a fair shake. And then not only, by the way, this is not just Jews or my grandparents. These are poor people. All the immigrants that came here in the 20s, 30s, 40s, poor people from all over the country, didn't speak the language, didn't have two nickels to rub together, and never fucking complained. And not only didn't they complain, but they grew up, my two grandfathers and everyone else, they grew up and then they went and fought in World War II. And they they took boats here when they immigrated across the ocean. They took a boat back. They went to Europe. They went to Asia. They went to Africa. And they fought to defend the country they love, to defend just the ideals of of the freedoms and liberties. They appreciated it so much that they were willing to get on these boats and sail back across the world and fight real fascism, you know, real evil and defeat. Imagine that today. Imagine people today even, not only wouldn't they defend it, They want to tear it down themselves from inside. If zero mentality that our grandfathers had, that our grandparents had, and the more inclined we are to tear down our history, tear down free speech, free expression. We're going to forget it all. We tear it down and we we don't appreciate what these prior generations did and try to emulate it. Why wouldn't you want to be like that generation? They call it the greatest generation for a reason, right? We can emulate that. We can have that mentality. I'm not talking about having that. You say, oh, there's rules that this and then they weren't equal, whatever. I'm talking about the mentality of I'm going to try my hardest and I'm going to put something into this world and put something into this society. If we forget all that, we're going to forget what made us great in the first place. And we're going to become something else. You know, where's our humility? Where's our appreciation? I'm proud to have the flag back there. I, I, 
I'll always be proud of the image it portrays. If we do anything in life, we should be applying logic and reason and understanding and learning, not making these knee-jerk, emotional, stupid decisions and calculations and just screaming, you know, things that don't mean anything. You know, don't let emotion cloud what you know deep down to be correct. You know, don't let hatred for one orange man or any individual distort what you've always known deep inside to be true. You know, these things have been true for a long, long time. People know that. I'm just getting a little emotional right now, but um, we can say or do whatever we want in this country, and thank God for that, and that is the main thing we should be preserving. So don't lose sight of what it means to be free. And if that means we have to hear shit we don't like, or we have to hear sometimes shit that makes us uncomfortable, so be it. You know, that's called freedom. Liberally, liberty. It's the most fundamental things we stand for. Why do people want to throw that away? The very things that allow people to say what they want to say. The very thing they're trying to tear down. They don't understand what they're throwing away. They think we just backed, you know, ass backwards into this thing. (sighs) You can't let extremists take over. You can't let good, decent people be afraid to speak their minds. You can't let good, decent people, you can't let extremists take over on any side, ever. Good, decent people need to have the ability to express themselves without fear, to have their children express themselves without fear. That's what our country is built on, period. We take that away and we do become a fascistic society. We got to do a better job of that. The more appreciation we show and the more we put into the world, is the more better off everyone's going to be. Love and appreciate your country. Love and appreciate each other. Don't let emotion cloud your judgment. Try to remember all the things that make life so fucking great. What it really boils down to is optimism, right? If you try to see the best in people and society and then figure out the things you can contribute, right? Don't try to tear it all down, right? What do you just tear it all down for? Be a builder, Don't be a destroyer. Anyway. With that, I will leave you guys for now. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening or watching. We are on iTunes now. We are on Spotify. Soon we're going to be on Pandora. We're going to be on iHeartRadio. All that. Wherever you search for it, it's John cats show j-o-n-k-a-t-z show hit us up on twitter like i said hit me up questions any topics you want to discuss all that kind of stuff i want to interact with people it's at john cat show on twitter and or uh, email is john at john cat show.com um really i want to read some good questions and i will definitely like four people watching this thing so far brand new show So if you send me an email, chances are I'm going to end up reading it on here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it so much. I will be back very soon with another episode, probably in two days. I'm trying to put out like one every two days right now. Uh, Maybe we'll get even more going or hopefully get some guests, good, good guests lined up. So I appreciate you all. I will see you soon. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the combo. Peace.